from Belgium. He's an old timer. He has been with us ever since we started this enterprise several years ago. I hate to count the number of years. And uh, he is uh, going to take over my slot this morning. The same topic, but uh, he is going to do it because he only has a few days. Maybe you are leaving tomorrow. So we take advantage. And uh, I would like to say that this may be a little bit repetitious in the sense that yesterday afternoon I was already talking about the arbitrage of the retail merchant between the consumer goods market and the bill market. And uh, it will be interesting to see the same topic discussed from a different uh, point of view. So I pass it on to you, Peter. You are on. Thank you. Um, I see a lot of familiar faces. I also see a few faces that I have never seen. Um, my name is Peter. As, I've, as you have heard, um, for those people who don't know me, um, I tax consultant in Belgium. And I'll give you uh, my email and the website. Uh, if it's in English, by the way, you can always revert back because a lot of my slides that I have used in the past are also on my website. This is my email. It's not Gmail, it's my company, uh, Pintax. Pintax stands for Pintax. The is the V-A-N. Peter, V-A-N, Copernolic. You can also use info at Pintax.de. But Pintax is, uh, basically, it's an abbreviation of private investment and tax advice. As simple as that. Now that you know what I do, you immediately know the link. Private investment and taxes are linked and they are also linked in, uh, to what the, the work of Professor Fichetti. Um I specialize in capital protection for customers. Now it immediately becomes evident that um, we need to provide, well, I would like to provide, provide uh, capital protection for customers. Um, and with that, I have to make a little jump to the uh, Sandeep Jaitley Provident Fund, or should I say <laughs> the Monsoon Fund, sorry. <laughs> uh, little joke, Sandeep. Because um, that is a gold and silver fund maybe not silver at the, in, in the beginning, which pays in gold and protects you in gold. Even on liquidation, you would probably uh, have the choice and the option to uh, be paid out in gold. There is a tax link, of course, but that is not the topic of today. Uh, the topic of today would be um, possibly repetitious. However, I've chosen to take a different format. Um, there is no better way, I think, to uh, have a little review midweek of what so far has been seen. I need to stop. I need to stop for 10 seconds for the batteries. Oh, the battery's dead. Blinking. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, was, I was about to say, give me your weekend. By the way, um, Keith, the, the server is in your neighborhood. I think it's Bluehost. Bluehost.com. Where is that? Yes. 
wherever you are in, in, in the States, in near the Nevada desert. Um, I want again. Okay, you can edit this. Huh? So there is no better format, I think, to review midweek um, what we have seen or what what you have probably seen already, than by using a, 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 a the criticism that has been launched by other people. Um, I've chosen a document written by Mr. Robert Blumen. <coughs> um, okay, snigger, snigger. <laughs> I didn't. Um, the, the, as we go along, I will read a few paragraphs and I will go through because every paragraph that he writes, we, we, I'll, I'll use as a recognition point and revert back to uh, the lectures. And in fact, let's kick off here. Mr. Blumen starts his criticism of the real Bill doctrine by a sentence that he quotes from, from um, Mises. Mises. Mi Mises. Um, yes. Yeah. <laughs> von Ludwig von Mises. I, I have. Uh, I'm not familiar with these names. I'm sorry. The masses are misled by the assertion of the pseudo experts, wrote Mises, that cheap money can make them prosperous at no expense whatever. Well, good point, Mr. Uh, von Mises. There's nothing wrong with that point. I can't find this. So his opening sentence is fine, but he follows. Robert Blumen, that is. In spite of efforts by classical and Austrian economists to refute it, oh, sorry, I should say, the damage that this inflationary fallacy has done to our monetary institutions cannot be overestimated. That's his second sentence. That's not Mises who wrote this. That is Mr. Blumen. There's already immediately a, f a logical error here. He starts out by saying this is an inflationary fallacy. Okay, but he's now committing the error of uh, w w what is called the petitio principi. Is that the correct pronunciation in, in English? <laughs> petitio principi. Petizio. Petizio. I'll write it down. The, the logical error, and, and those students of you who are taking classes in logic. Petizio. 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 I think it's. I'm, I'm not sure. Petizio principi. Principi. Yes, that's right. That would be right, eh? Right. Thank you. Our yeah, Italian and Roman. Ancestor has uh, confirmed my writing. <laughs> but this is this is a classical logical error. You are taking for granted what you still need to prove, namely that this is an inflationary one and a fallacy two. <sighs> okay, sentence one was right. Sentence two, here we go. Besides that, let's let's listen to him. In spite of efforts by classical um, economists to um, refute it. Now the, refute, the refutation would be that this is um, not a fallacy, the real bill doctrine. It has been uh, resurrected under many guises. It's, why does he say resurrected? It's always <coughs> been there. It's never been killed. I don't understand. Um, but all with the same error at its core. And the error he states that printing money can create real wealth. Okay, the sentence printing money can create wealth is indeed an error. But he's confusing a few things here. A real bill is not printing money. It is not. And as you have seen, uh, he falls short of uh, proving the real bills doctrine as a fallacy. I'm sorry, but that, that Mr. Robert Blumen, uh, under his, underneath his paper, it is stated that Mr. Blumen uh, is a, um, and I read it for you. 
Robert Blumen is an independent enterprise software consultant based in San Francisco. <laughs> As, <laughs> well, I would, I would have, um, with all respect, I would have said, I would have thought that software consultants would be very logical people. Um, well, it says consultant, didn't say engineer. Independent consultant, your business usually is coding for unemployed programmers. Keith, you're you're on camera. That's okay. <laughs> well, th that may explain that may explain. Um, but but of course, this fallacy is also repeated by other people, namely by Sean Corrigan, who is a, a Swiss. ICT consultant. <laughs> well, yes, he is. I mean, uh, the same the same error is compounded. And he goes on by saying that a libertarian writer he refers he refers to Nelson Holbrook and uh, to Professor Fekete. Um He goes on by saying that the real Bill's doctrine has a long and controversial. History. It has a long history. In fact, it is a history from the 11th century and prob probably even before. Uh, the 11th century. I'm, I'm a bit of. I'm always intrigued by history. The 11th century. We, we, I mean, that's a thousand years ago, but we can still find evidence. Um, I'm not that. Um, uh, I, I know. I know a few Latin words, but I do not know enough Latin to go back a thousand years to invest, for instance, to investigate documents by the Venetian bankers of that century, because it all emerged with the Venetian bankers going to places like Sevilla, going to places uh, Venice, uh, also on the east, uh, the west coast of, of uh, not only the, it's not only the Venetian bankers, it is the Florentine bankers who were first. Sorry. Um, the emergence of, of real bills has a long history. Um, part of, of what the program of today uh, would, would, be, uh, would, would be a little discussion, or at least my view of how real bills can uh, refer to social capital and to social circulating capital. Now, here's, here's my view. Here's my take. There are traces that are 1,000 years old in our practice and law today. There is a law on bills, on real bills. I, uh, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Gaetano, is there, is there a European directive on bills? I don't know. I didn't see any. I, I... Huh? I didn't see any. I don't think there is any. So every country has its own merchant practices into a legal system. Legal systems today, when you make a company, refer to what, what we call a social, uh, on the, in the continental system, we have a social seat. In the uh, English system, it would be the seat of incorporation. Besides the legal differences, we would, you know, the, French, the French are the best to, to explain. It is, in French, it's called the siège social. Your social seat, the place where you are incorporated. They will also speak today of your, again, French, capital. Social capital. You know, it comes back. It should ring a bell. This is the capital that a merchant in the 11th century has to do his business. Now, I grant any criticism that in the 11th century there were no legal persona, there was no societe anonyme, or there was no limited corporation that came until much later. But he had capital. 
And that capital, until today, is called social capital. Screwed up Mr. Blumen says it has a long history. If I would doubt if it is after a thousand years, if it's still debatable, I think it's a practice for more than a thousand years what that, that bills have been following and, and that got that whole practice was, was codified, let's say, in, in, into law until, of course, the um, big financial institutions left their fingerprints into today's law, which they changed it. Social capital is circulating. My view on that is this. And the professor has mentioned it in, in one and several papers on real bills, but um, on, on his, um, <coughs> in his paper, Interest and Discount, which you'll find on the section Academic Papers, but also uh, the, the, the several places where he mentions this. Social capital belongs to several mergers. If you have several mergers in New Zealand, And these shopkeepers, as it is called, decide on what merchandise to keep on their shelves. It's simple. Certain goods have a higher return, others have none. Or lesser, and some may be negative. Of course, you'd be fool, a fool to put them to put on your shelves or to keep on your shelves those goods that are not, not even turning. These are the fast turning ones. If you are in New Zealand, and I make specific reference to New Zealand, it suffered an earthquake. What goods are in high demand? I would say cement and steel. There are several shopkeepers who have cement and steel, but there are thousands of others in New Zealand who would uh, have a Toys R Us type of store or something else. Imagine, after an earthquake, what is, what is, what is your chances of, of selling Barbie dolls? Those Barbie dolls are not going to get rid of your shelves. What is in high demand is right now cement and steel and other goods. Now, if you can get away with a 50% markup <laughs> and you can get rid of that within one day, your, well, this is a formula, and every, every shopkeeper can, can work it out, and I haven't worked it out, but it gives you, it gives you a figure, and this would be cement. And that is, that is the um, social circulate, the, the social capital, social capital that is invested in this type of merchandise. Cement. It's got a high return. You would, you would probably find during an earthquake that food, stuff, and water would also be there in the higher ones. But Barbie dolls or Chinese widgets would probably not move very fast for the time being. Those merchants who have their capital tied up in less profitable goods could sell up, not replenish their shelves, and decide to put their money into this. That, that doesn't mean they have to convert their businesses. <coughs> that, would, that would take massive investment costs. They would just buy the bills from the merchants that are, draw, that are drawing them. Because these merchants now have, well, they have their own social capital, but it's not enough because there is a local shortage of cement, <coughs> not worldwide. These bills that the local merchant will draw. And I see some, do I, do I see some faces that, what is, what is drawing a bill? 
Does anybody know the practice of drawing a bill? Mm -hmm. Drawing a bill is simple. It is, I am making a document in which I am ordering you to pay me in 91 days or less for the underlying goods that much money. It's an order. I sign it. I'm the drawer. You draw that on somebody, it's not called the drawee, it's the acceptant. The drawee is somebody else. That's usually the discount house in the old days, the acceptance house of the bank these days. Everybody with me? Because that is, I mean, most young people have not seen a bill. It is, it is a document with several places and you need to sign here the drawy and oh, it's on the back, on the back. <laughs> <laughs> the endorsement. The endorsement, the endorsement would be on the back, but the acceptance and the oh, well, yeah, these days you need to sign for a vowel and you know, it's got several sides and it can be attached with the goods or whatever. But this yes, this in fact this this in fact does not to be need to be attached to it. It's still no bill. Or the the, the um and the bill does can circulate on its own. Why does it circulate on its own? Why? Because it's as good as gold. It's as simple as that. Here we see why. You have competitors who put their own social capital <coughs> to another one. They put their money with a competitor. They are giving him money, and for every hundred, they're giving him, let's say, 99.5. So there's a discount of half a percent. Could be, could be uh, higher or lower. Uh, that, that depends on market conditions. In fact, it depends on what you get away with. <laughs> As in, in, in New Zealand, at the time of the earthquakes, you could, you could probably get away with a lot more. But that means you, this one, who has some social capital, can make it circulate by providing it to your competitor or whoever has, if there is no earthquake, I mean, in your off season, you make it circulate by going, by providing it to somebody else who has a better season. That's how social capital circulates. That's how it started, marginally. It later got a lot compli more complicated. But this is a vote of confidence. This is a vote of confidence. It is so public that, that your competitors are willing to give you their money. This is not a form, it's, it's, it's a form of credit, if you like, but it's not a loan. Eh? These goods are as good as gold well because the cement will be sold, for sure. And the steel will be sold, for sure. And the judgment of that lies with all these people who provide you with that. Of course, that's the beginning. In the later stages, you have uh, a discount house with um, specialists who would obviously be the more um, liquid. They have their own capital and they have advisors and people, you know, you don't need, in the beginning, you needed to know who is the person that you put your hand to. And only for 91 days, by the way. And those of you who are interested in saying, well, why don't you carry it to the bank with interest? Why do you put it with a bill? I mean, what's the difference? There's this arbitrage between inter the, the interest-bearing funds and the funds that you provide here with bills. Please note, there is a difference between the interest rate and the discount rate. The main point being that the interest rate is higher, always marginally higher than the discount rate. And why is that? Well, very simple. There's more risk in interest. With this discounted bill, there's hardly ever risk because it's as good as gold. That's why interest is always higher. You could say, well, fine. I don't want to put my money with, in a bill. I'll, I'll take the interest. But then please know that you also take more risk. That's why <coughs> riskless investors take their own social capital, make it circulate by 
accept the pearl by, by providing fossil fuel. <coughs> it's riskless. That's the reason. That's the reason why this can float by itself. It is not. It is a form of credit, if you like, but it's 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 not. Um, it's not a loan. A loan looks totally different. As a little digression here. Is anybody disagreeing with my uh, preliminary view on why social capital can circulate? Because this is social capital. And it in fact comes from your competitors, possibly, or from your fellow colleagues. And there are several thousands of shopkeepers. And probably in the medieval times, when it all started, there were three classes of people. Clergy, who didn't work. You had royalties and nobility. And then you had the guilds people. We're talking about the guilds people here, yeah, huh? that's social cap capital. That's their capital cir circulating. Which did not prevail the noblemen from putting their money also into, into guilds. Probably. I don't have ev documentary evidence, but who knows? Um, it's, it's just, I mean, it's not, wouldn't it? So the real Bill's doctrine finds its way into today's law and practice. It's a thousand years old, at least. And to call this controversial, I find that a bit harsh. It's been debated in the currency and, and, and banking school debate of, of uh, the 19th century in, in England. But that debate, I think, is overrated because you had influences from uh, the currency school who would like to put their view, and they made it controversial. They won the game, anyway. In his third paragraph, he says, the doctrine of real bills concerns debts. Huh? Debts? formed by transactions between business firms. I have a problem with the word debt, but we'll grant him that. Um, debt means that you have a loan. This is not a loan, this is just a tie over for a couple of days. It's as good as gold, and you have the full faith and credit of your competitors putting their money into your business. Not much debt, nor is there much risk. So he starts with this word debt, and when a firm purchases raw materials or partially finished goods on credit, a debt is created. I have, I have no problem with, with the sentence, but in the context of bills, raw materials are higher level goods. And the purchase of raw materials or higher level goods do not involve drawing bills. Drawing a bill you do on finished goods in high demand. <coughs> the production of cement, you need to finance that differently. The sale of cement and getting the cement from worldwide sources to New Zealand, that involves drawing bills. That way you also get capital because you, you, your discount rate will start going up and then makes it very attractive uh, for people all over the world to start supplying you with cement temporarily. But the f uh, I, don't, I don't get this criticism. Um, when a firm purchases raw materials or partially finished goods on credit, a debt is created. Sorry, but this has nothing to do with real bills. It's, it's out of place. This is, this is um, perhaps my way uh, of harsh criticism, but um, when, when you review a text, when you read something on the internet, uh, you, you need to critically 
read what you, whatever you are reading. Yeah? It's not gospel. It's not written in stone. Certainly this is not. Sorry, Mr. Blumen. He goes on by saying, as an example, a manufacturer of chairs purchases wood from his supplier with a bill of exchange due in 30 days. No. You can't purchase wood with a bill. No, you can't. The chairs, yes. Not the wood. Two weeks later, finding himself short on cash, I believe that, to make payroll, the wood supplier takes the bill to his local bank. <coughs> well, sorry, yeah, should be discount house. Which purchases the note from him for 98% of its value. The discount rate here being 2% for 14 days annualized. When I read this, I know. <gasps> Goosh! Anybody understand what 2% for 14 days means? That's extortion, eh? Did, did he, I'm sorry, I want to repeat this. Did he say that the chair manufacturer takes the bill to the bank? Is that what he said? That's what he said. The wood, the wood, the wood manufacturer. The wood. The wood. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Well, he could be in possession of a bill, no, that's uh, but for whatever reason, but this is not the way to finance. You don't use a bill to finance wood. You, you, I mean, that's you, you, you use <coughs> bills to finance <coughs> user uh, final consumer goods in high demand the cement ready presented on bags on a pallet uh, you know bags that that can be carried away y y I mean otherwise how could other people trust that there's a high amount of trust involved here you do not just trust a wood manufacturer that I mean nobody would accept this kind of bill I wouldn't if it was about um, um, cement in, in New Zealand, I would accept it. If, I mean, people live in a community. They know what's going on. They know who, who they can trust. They know their merchants and the surrounding merchants. They would know. They would trust. This is, this is not only social circulating capital, but also some kind of social control. And you speak about social control also in the bill market. It, it needs to be open for scrutiny. And it's public. I mean, nobody would accept a bill on raw goods. It's just, just too far away. You can never make, in 90 days, you can never make payment from, from timber that still needs to be cut. If you have the finished chairs, probably in 90 days you'll, you'll get rid of all of them. That's why you can trust it. I wouldn't trust and I will never accept the practice of, you know, discount me a bill for 90 days for, you know, plain wood. We'll see what happens. No, no, no. I'm not that kind of trusty a person. And neither were these people in medieval times and nor are they now. It will not circulate at all. So, Mr. Blumen is making several mistakes here. Um, he doesn't know very well the practice where it originated, neither does he know what it's all about. I stopped by saying the discount rate here being 2% for 14 days, that, that is extortion. It comes down to 15, 57 odd percent annualized. Would, would, you, would, would you accept being, would you accept those terms? Goosh, that's harsh. I would not accept a bill like that unless, unless of course, I was. I know I have a reasonable chance of having a very big markup on on cement and steel. And if there is an earthquake, I have a reasonable chance of having a high markup, and that that would make up for the uh, for the losses on, in, on on well not interest but on discounting. And you're at all. You're always. Um, I mean. This is, this, is, this is another practice, what banks do. It's called illicit arbitrage, illicit interest arbitrage. Have you, have you spoken about that, Professor, the illicit arbitrage between the interest rates and the discount? Well, we talked about uh, 
borrowing sh short yes. running long, which is basically illicit yeah. arbitrage yeah. by another man. This, I mean, what what Mr. Blumen refers to in his example to refute the real bills doctrine. Basically, he mixes up a few things, shakes shakes it all, and then comes up with an argument. No, no, no. He gives a perfect example of one illicit arbitrage and two of of modern um, um, banking uh, practices. He's, he's mixing those up. What, what is happening here in his example is that somebody with a bill rings the comes goes to the bank. The bank takes the bill, has a good look. Hmm. Fine. And in this case, it's 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 drawn for raw raw material. Immediately, you should. You should realize this is not for finished goods. So this is um, an opportunity for fraud. And the bank keeps it in its portfolio. It is hidden. <coughs> what is happening is that the bank sells this bill at the going rate. It takes it. But you are the one who is accepting what terms? 2% for 14 days, 57% annualized. And you probably have to put up collateral in the form of a house as well. Wow. Now, if you accept those terms, you're, you're mad. But anyway, um, this is a good example of, 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 non, of, of illicit arbitrage. Um, banks, by the way, do not uh, create credit. Huh? This process is not credit creation. It's a negotiation of credit. Because where did they get, where, where, the credit exists already in the bills market. Where they discount the bill and they sell you the interest rate. The difference is, for, is, is between them because the bill is um, probably not sold for 57% for annualized, but a lot less. The difference is for them. The bank has not created credit, by the way, which is another mistake. Bank has, banks have not created any credit. They have negotiated it. The collateral that you have to put up with, with is just making it easier. Um, but it's not money creation either. But you can see what, what the, the tone of the argument goes into. He's, he's making several mistakes and then leads you into believing uh, we are talking about uh, credit. Then he makes you believe, or the tone of the article makes you believe that um, this is money creation. So he says, no special banking doctrine is required to justify an ordinary loan transaction. No, you should one should reject this. It's not a loan transaction. A real bill is not a loan. None of these people need, need a loan. They have their social circulating capital. They have their money. And they have full faith in credit in the, um, m the merchants with the cement. Otherwise, they would not give them their money. It, the, the social capital would not circulate there. So they don't need credit. They, they, they basically have it already. They don't need loans. Let's put it that way. The credit is given by the faith of these people. I, I grant the word credit. We, we cannot circumvent that. No special banking doctrine is required, nor is any new monetary theory required when firms wish to resell their paper assets for, to buyers for cash on a commercial paper market. He's suggesting already there's, a, there's some kind of paper money involved. There's no paper money. A bill is not paper money. A bill will mature into gold. Please realize that. Because it materializes 
in, or it matures into gold coin or silver coin. It's a future good, but it's, it's, a, it's future gold. Maximum 91 days. It is not paper money. Paper money would involve another promissory note which keeps on rolling. This is, this is wrong. Then he goes on and makes another mistake which... The real bills doctrine comes into play when the loan is sold to a bank. <coughs> we know that it's not a loan. Suppose that the holder of a real bill needs cash before the, bills fall, before the bill falls due. Perhaps he needs to pay off his own bills to his own suppliers. He would then present the bill to a bank. The bank, having been, per having been persuaded by some clever monetary theorist huh, to adopt the real bills doctrine, discounts the bill. Now, when, since when do banks need external advisors like monetary crank theorists? <laughs> I find this a, <laughs> a hard to swallow sentence. Um, but I, I've chosen this article because it's comical in a way. And, and the professor actually um, exposes the, uh, and as I do here, um, exposes the ignorance um, of the people who have criticism. If you have criticism, please, you know, before you write, just come and listen to a few colleges on the real bills doctrines. It is crucial to understand that in the workings of the real bills doctrine, bills are to be funded not with the bank's own equity capital, <coughs> that is true, nor with savings loaned to the bank by its creditors. I grant that. Bills are not funded at all in the economic sense of the term. Okay, this sentence is correct. Why is that correct? Well, bills are social circulating capital. It's not, it's, it's, it is other people's money, but it's not the banks. And in fact, you don't need the banks. Because your competitors and your other buddies in the business will spontaneously discount your bills. They will give you the money for a discount and for a guaranteed return. You don't need a bank. Later on the practice of a discount house may, may exist because that's the same thing, just more specialized. But you don't need banks because, I mean, this is merchant, the discount houses are, I think, merchant banking. Right? That's what you call merchant banking? Commercial. Is it commercial? Mm -hmm. I would say. But what is that merchant banking? Merchant bank is an uh, investment bank. They okay. are concerned with interest, loans, lending, borrowing. Yeah. <coughs> Let's draw a big line between them. One could call this a discount house, and this is your ordinary bank, if there is a need for that. They probably have certain, I mean, people would need, still need merchant banks, but the role these days of, of the commercial banks was, in the days of the real bills doctrine, a lot higher and a lot more prominent. Why? <coughs> because real bills were in portfolio. We uh, introduced the concept of credit arising out of savings as opposed to credit arising out of consumption. And from this point of view, the merchant bank is the one who manages credit arising out of savings. And the commercial bank manages credit consumption out of bills. Which, I mean, this is another interesting point. Those of you who have uh, listened to last year's um, expose would remember <clears throat> uh, 
would remember the world model. Hexagonal model, we're not going into that one. You have interest rates, you have the floor, and you have the ceiling. Anybody trying to volunteer? What rules? What rules the floor rate and the ceiling rate? This is the marginal bond holder. This is the time preference. Remember, huh? time preference of money. This, if you, if interest rates rise too high, the marginal bond holder will take his opportunity and say, fine. And he waits. Of course, he, he waits until the interest rates have dropped to that point where he can say, hmm, nice capital gain. Remember? Because when interest rates drop, the bond holder realizes a capital gain. I see faces. Do I need to explain this? No problem. I'm sorry. You understand? Okay. This is the, the flow rate of interest because now, um, as I said before, the, this is where the, um, the merchants and the commercial banks come in. There is a discount rate, and it's distinct. Uh, if, if you have, let's say, 5%. The discount rate would be always a bit lower. <coughs> Why is that? It's a safer investment. It's a safer investment. Okay. It could temporarily go up, but it's very temporary. Please understand. <laughs> the safer investment has the least interest rate, of course. And this is what banks do. Huh? They loan you the money because you need a loan, sir. No, you don't. When you come with a bill and then the bank manager tells you, oh, of course, I'll discount this for you. No, it doesn't. At 5%. Meantime, he goes and sells this at 4%. And the difference is his. It's easy. This practice should be outlawed. One of the criticisms that was launched was how can you outlaw this and this is like competition with the best bank be the winner, winner takes all. A nonsensical argument. In most civilized countries we have laws against misrepresentation, against fraud, against well, you know, if you misrepresent something, you, you are liable. At your own risk and peril, you can do that. See if you get away with it. Sometimes you can. The point of the criticism was, at a certain point, well, how can you? How can you make this practice illegal? It's, it's so easy. Well, that is easy because there's no law against it. And then they say, well, if you, even if you make a law against it, what's the point? They will still do it. And what's the point of having a law against theft if you are presuming already there is, they go there, there I mean, nobody will, will listen or, or, or will, pre, um, will they actually comply with normal civil law practices. If there's a law against theft and there's a law against illicit arbitrage, Let's adhere to it. Simple as that. You cannot, you cannot steal, and that's the law. That's that's normal. Yes. It's a two cents word. It's not. It, I think it's worse than that. There's not only allow it to happen, but stand behind it. When the time comes that this thing crashes, then they step in and say, "Oh, here's some more money. Keep doing what you're doing." It's like if the criminal doesn't succeed with his plot, something happens. Well. How come out? Getting back into the theft business. Yes. And then getting more money. Yes. Now, here is already a point where we should, that should be 
that refers to modern practices. Today's laws are not the laws that were created by merchant habit and the lawyers beside Gitano, are there any more? <coughs> Law has a few sources. One is, of course, the written, the written law, but also practice and custom is a source of law. Huh? Merchant practice for over a thousand years is also law. Lex mercatoria. Lex mercatoria, exactly. What happens? In comes the financial institutions after the creation of a different kind of financial system. Well, they're powerful, of course, and they dictate. They dictate how the law should look like. And really, this is what well, sticking to real bills. Not only is there no criminal law against illicit arbitrage, you can see the fingerprints or the footprints, if you like, in the in the bills law as well. And, and I'm, I'm taking the example of that one, one specific example. Going back to a bill, it has several places where you have to draw, where you have to places for signatures. Law as it used to be, version law, was that I command you, Mr. Cement uh, Keeper, to pay me in 91 days 100,000. Now, before I give him the money, he needs to accept. This paper will, will circulate. That's merchant practice. What happened in today's law? Well, sir, no need for the merchant to accept. We, the acceptance house, and they don't call themselves acceptance house, will do it for you. No need for a signature. In fact, the, re the so-called reason behind this would be that if you <coughs> write out a ghost document for goods that never existed. I mean, this, this is it, if ever. Huh? I just make a phony bill and say, I command you, Mr. X, to pay me 100,000. My signature. And the acceptance house covers it. <coughs> this bill doesn't circulate. <coughs> Unless the laws are a bit twisted. And of course the law then says, well, if your signature is on it, you are the drawer, you are ultimately re liable to pay the sum. Because, I mean, if this bounces like a check, uh, whoever holds the bill will come for the money with you. Which is kind of logic. But you can see the footprint of the acceptance house who has already pocketed the difference as a day, don't want to end up being liable for the entire capital sum, of course. They'll go back to you. Under its own steam, this bill would be accepted and the acceptor will carry the can if the bill is not paid, because he, was, he has accepted the order to pay. And if he, if he fails to sell the cement, then he fails to come up with the money. And then he needs to invade his piggy bank in order to come up with the money. This is the acceptor. This is the drawing. The drawer, sorry. Here I make a phony bill. So called phony bill. But um, the acceptance house ties me over, and of course they're sheltering me. They're sheltering this. And they put up collateral. I'll have to put up collateral because obviously this is. Risky business. Uh, this, this, will not, this will not circulate um, in the old days, and it will certainly not cir circulate now. The 
can see the footprints in several of these um, legal provisions <coughs> which deviate from, from, from merchant practice um, in a major way and usually if you read those laws bear in mind that it's not the lawmakers who, who have written those laws it's somebody else <coughs> huh? they written out the law and presented that for a rubber print to, to parliament so they are covered and I'm talking about the acceptance house, the banks they are covered okay, we, we, that was a little bit of a political digression but necessary in, in modern context reverting back to uh, the criticism that was launched against the real bill doctrine Mr. Blumen says Haldberg that's Nelson Haldberg and Fekete present a series of arguments for the adoption of the discounting mechanism yeah that's true in the interests of space this essay will address some, but not all of them. He's now going to select the arguments. He can <coughs> say something about it, but not all of them. Yeah. Smile. He then says, credit intermediation without expansions is not elastic. Credit by itself is too rigid. The limitation of borrowing to previous savings will reduce economic growth. The term contractionist means essentially the same thing. Or equivalently, expanding credit beyond savings enable more goods to be produced. In the absence of paper credit, business for firms will not be able to obtain a sufficient amount of short-term credit. Now, God, this whole paragraph is, is a mystery. This whole paragraph is a mystery. He talks about elasticity, the credit expansion, but real bills do not expand credit. He says it's too rigid. I don't get it. It's pointless. Anyway, I don't know, Professor, did, did you say that Mises was a monetary crime? Uh, no, he was a very great man. Yeah. He made mistakes like we all do and stand to be corrected. Mm. <laughs> he, uh, I think, as you say, Mises was a, a uh, proper scientist, and if he would be alive today, there would be a good chance that he would accept criticism. Oh, he, I think he did, as long as he was active, but mm -hmm. uh, I think his major mistake was an uh, absolute commitment to the quantity theory of money. Yes, and, uh, the, the quantity theory of money, and I admit myself, this is, oof, it's seductive. It's very seductive. I have to kick my own brain once in a while, and... I mean the the uh, well you you okay we'll, we'll we'll go back to the argument but uh, the I started out by saying that Mr. Blumen here writes down that you called Mises a monetary crank because he says I the, never did. the he monetary, monetary yeah crank. <laughs> he, he says he says yeah the monetary crank wrote Mises <laughs> no, you didn't it's obviously he's, he's wrong. All variants of monetary crankism suffer from the same error. That now he goes back to the argument that he says that he said in the beginning, which Mises was. I mean, Mises was right. Monetary crankism, like John Law, of John Law of uh, Lariston. Lariston. I was about to say Preston. Yes, who descended on France, poor French. Um, 
he was a monetary crank, but he was brilliant in a way because yeah. because he knew how to extract um, a way of living <laughs> for a while. <laughs> um, these days we would call them um, well, well, we would we would call them what people that go around and borrowing money from others. Can't never paying it back. It's, it's like fraud, fraud fraudulent fraudsters. Con artists. Yeah, mad artists. Con artists. Now, the 17th century con artist, by example, would have been John Law, but he was brilliant enough to save his own life. Uh, he he took big chances uh, with the French court. By the way, the guillotine still existed then. No. No wonder he escaped wearing a wig and a lady's frock. I think the guillotine was in that a little later. Oh, this maybe is well as before the French. Oh, or maybe, maybe as a result. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm not it, was, it was invented by a medical doctor by the name of Monsieur Guillotine. Was it? Oh. Oh, yes. <laughs> and, and if your arm hurts, then he said. Cut it off. <laughs> Don't go to him for a headache. <laughs> we've, we've covered the criticism in this article because he just goes back on his own illogical arguments. Um, it's, I'm, I'm afraid, there's nothing new. And the, art the article by Sean Corrigan repeats it. If you read these articles for yourself, um, and I I'm not sure, are you reading them now? Are you reading the news? <laughs> no, you, you do. Well, I mean, you need to do whatever you want. But um, the, if you read these articles by yourself um, at your own leisure, they um, fail to convince me in their logic or in, in their argument. There is, maybe, uh, Professor, one, one question I would like to ask you, and that is, and I, haven't, I really haven't had much time to think this over, but um, if we have the flow rate and the ceiling rate for an interest, Why shouldn't we have that with a discount rate? Well, we discussed this yesterday huh? before you arrived. Um, the, uh, the, the, you see, the, the axiom which we take over from Menger, Karl Menger, is that there is never ever a monolithic price. Never ever. Not even for the always two prices. Even for the ask and the bid. Yeah. The ask is higher, the bid is lower. Now, he announced this for commodities. Uh, but we can apply it to the uh, uh, credit markets as well. So if you go to the bond market, the bond price will have an ask and a bid. And there's a spread between. And exactly the same is true for the bill market. There is an ask and a bid for the bill market. But there's a difference, and that's the important thing, and that's the answer to your question. The spread in the bond market is wide. And there is limited ways to make it narrower. However, in the bill market, the spread is, is, is very small. Not exploitable. And now, I said yesterday that the reason is because the bill is an appreciating asset. Every day it will be worth more because um, the uh, number of days to maturity uh, get less and less. So accordingly, the discount, which is applied to the face value, gets less. 
Yes. So it's an appreciating asset. Now, somebody came to me and said, well, uh, the bond is an appreciating asset because a bond which is going to mature in 30 days, well, even after one day, it's closer to maturity. Well, but, I mean, you know, if it matures in 30 years or it matures in 30 days, that makes a hell of a lot of difference. So you don't notice, it's, it's uh, microscopic. And besides, the turbulence in the bond market is much, much greater because the risks are greater. So we can accept it that the bill is an appreciating asset and the bond is not really an appreciated for practical purposes. Theoretically, maybe for practice, it's not. And therefore, if you buy a bill and turn around and want to sell it, you are very often successful to sell it exactly the same price. And Manger says this never happens. Well, of course, he was talking about commodities. Try to buy something and immediately sell it at the same price. You won't succeed. Well, in the bill market is different because the spread is so small that for practical purposes, okay, and therefore, uh, a display between the floor and the ceiling of the discount rate doesn't come into play. Exactly. It's, it's within the noise. It's so small that uh, you can ignore it. And, and we yes. do. There's no benefit, no profit in refining your theory to introduce that distinction, which is very important for the bond market. Negligible. This reminds me, maybe, correct me if I'm wrong, to Exter's inverted pyramid. What? John Exter's inverted pyramid. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. This is a brilliant invention or representation. And in fact, if you have gold and silver here, you may just as well put bills here. Bills next, yeah. yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And all other commodities with a much higher spread, like, like um, diamonds. Stocks, real uh, estate. Even stocks, even. yeah. And real, real estate would be probably be even higher. This, John Exeter was brilliant enough to devise a mechanism or at least a representation where the spreads between buy and sell and he did, I don't think he ever mentioned it but he intuitively applied John Menger in his uh, in his pyramid because where the spreads are high this ranks very high the spreads between buy and sell become lower and, I mean, gold and silver, there is also a spread. Well, in fact, and this is a measure of liquidity. Yeah. Uh, instead of real estate, we should say mortgages, really, because we, we are talking about real estate. Commodities. Um, well, anyhow, yeah. the point is that Man it's all implicit in, in Menger that he introduced a measure for liquidity. And the key that measure is the spread and how uh, elastic the spread is. Yes. And as you descend down in that inverted pyramid, the spread becomes smaller and smaller and smaller. And this is the measure of marketability or liquidity. And uh, yeah, you are right. This is. Uh, <coughs> Um, another way of looking at yeah. it. Peter. Uh, one uh, thing I'd be careful with to say that gold has a spread, not when gold is money. It has no spread. It is the numeraire, it's the measure. Yes. Actually, this is actually, actually gold does have a spread. Well, gold uh, points. And a gold coin is the gold points. Point. The, uh, one coin the gold does have a spread. Okay, that's what I'm referring to. But, yeah. you know, you're not really selling and buying gold, you're using gold to buy the other stuff with, that's the reference point. So, 
just to be sure that it's, that is the root thing. Now, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I think uh, we want <laughs> can we don't want to be cheated out of our coffee, right? So uh, I thank Peter. Thank you very much for coming and for telling us about this. this we'll put the question in slightly different uh, light, but we'll continue after the coffee with a discussion period. All right? Yes. Thank you very much.